outflow tap. Uh, super, it has superficial fibers which are continuous with the left ventricle and deep fibers which are continuous with the interventricular system. So I would really change this to two, three parts. So RB has actually three parts. Mm -hmm. You will have the RB which is the tricuspid annulus. Mm -hmm. Then you will have the trabecular apex. Mm -hmm. And you will have the outflow tract. So it's not two parts, it's three parts. And why you should know all the three parts? Because the problems will occur in these areas. Okay, why? Here, if there is problem, you know there is regurgitation. Here there is common sense for part of the rate policy and outflow track which will tell you about the pH. Sure. Understand? Huh? So there are three things that you should know. So whenever you are looking at a echo, you are supposed to look at these things. Okay? Huh? So the RV contraction actually occurs like in you know, a peristalsis like manner. There is the RV free wall and the intermediate septum. Uh, there is a bellow like movement of the uh, RV free wall and uh, the contraction happens in the peristalsis like uh, manner. The RV free wall is around 4 mm thick, which is almost one fourth to one third of the left ventricle. It requires 20 percent of the oxygen requirement. It pumps the same amount of blood as the left ventricle. The pulmonary vascular resistance against which the RV pushes the blood is 10 percent of the systemic vascular resistance. This is probably one of the best slides uh, you can think of. And why is this? so important for you to understand this slide. Why is it so important? Few things, few very important things, okay? Now, uh, contraction occurs in peristalsis like pattern. It's a bellow mechanism that she said, which is absolutely right what she's saying. It's a squeezing mechanism in the left ventricle, whereas here it's a bellow. What does it say? That is not a very, con not an extremely good contractile segment. It's different from the LV. So it's not this way that the RV will contract just like the LV. It's very important for you to understand that, okay? The second thing that she talks about is RV free wall is 4 mm thick. So what does this tell you is that if it if it has to get thick, you know if it has to get thick means it has to be chronic, very very chronic. It can't be acutely thick. Okay, the 4 mm thick. Third thing is oxygen requirements. Now what is the difference between the oxygen that the RV gets to its car into its muscles versus the oxygen that the LV gets? Can someone tell me the difference? between what the RV gets and what the LV gets. So, what's the difference? Come on. Anyone? What is the difference? LV wall is thick, so it requires more of oxygen. It requires more of oxygen, but, but in the way the oxygen goes, is there something different? Yes. So, systolic and diastolic. The perfusion and the coronary perfusion is, uh, of the RV is both in systolic and diastolic. That's the answer. The huh? ventricle, so, the in the left ventricle, most, you, most have, you have to decide. So the left ventricle is is uh, generally perfused in the diastole, okay. Whereas the right ventricle is in the systole as well as diastole. So that becomes a problem. You are understanding that becomes a problem. Why does that become a problem? Because if the systolic pressure comes down along with the diastolic pressure, the RV gets more affected, more affected. You are understanding. The RV gets more affected. Ischemia occurs more quicker. There is more problems that occur. You understand. So it's not just the heart rate that matters in, in left ventricle. Left ventricle is a heart rate that matters. You give more diastolic time, the more the left ventricle will get perfused. But here, you require pressure also. You require the systolics also to be high. Okay, huh? <coughs> ah, another thing, this one is also very important, the last word that you basically mentioned here. 10% of the SVR. What does this mean? The RV is pumping against almost no resistance. It's, that is why the thinking for a long period of time for all of us was if it's just a conduit. It is just a part for the blood to come from the top, get to here and get into the lungs. What, do you, what is the corollary to this? The corollary to this is that SVR is going very high but PVR is very low. Pulmonary vascular resistance is very very low. Pulmonary vascular resistance is very low. What do you do by doing ventilation? Increasing it. Massively. But intrapulmonary pressure is increased. Why is it increased? We peep. No, peep. Given the alveolus and opened up the alveolus, the alveolus is pressed against the pulmonary capillaries. That pulmonary capillaries, per se, that pressure is what you are seeing on the right side. Are you understanding? So the right ventricle is now going to push against the large pulmonary pressure. That is the idea of failure, patients of LV failure, RV failure, LV failure. One of the, the commonest cause of RV failure is LV failure. So if you have LV failure, you go to intubate them, they drop their blood pressures. What happened yesterday? to that patient who we intubated. What happened? Immediately the blood pressure dropped. You understand? Because what you are doing on that, you have not done anything different. What have you done? You have basically put in positive pressure. You have increased the pulmonary pressures. 
since you have increased the pulmonary pressures, the RV does not have the capacity to pump the blood into the pulmonaries. Since it does not have the capacity to pump the pulmonaries, the RV doesn't get the blood and the blood pressure drops. So, what is important for you? Bed number one isolation. What is important for you in bed number one isolation? Yesterday I did the echo. What did I tell you? Yesterday I did the echo on bed number one in isolation. What did I tell you about the RV? Who was there in rounds with me? You were there in rounds, no? I did the echo on isolation one. And what was that on ventilation? And then what did I tell you? RV has become slightly big. RV has become slightly big. Then I did RV is equal to LV. I told you that. Why did I, why did I make that statement? Because now I am expecting that because of the ARDS or because of the ventilation or because of the fluid overload, the RV is dilated which is not good. The reason of the heart failure is now evident. The reason of the breathing difficulty is now evident. So what my thing was, reduce the beat, reduce the tidal volume, diuresis this patient and we kept the patient on the ventilator. Are you, are you understanding? Huh? So this is a very important statement, very very important statement which you must not forget that the RV is only a conduit but it does not have any pressure to push. Are you understanding? Huh? So, uh, the main functions of the right ventricle are to generate the adequate pulmonary perfusion pressure for delivery of desaturated mixed venous blood to the alveoli for ga gas exchange and maintain the low systemic venous pressure to prevent the organ congestion. Uh, so yeah, it has more compliance for the volume of our reduction, but it fails against the higher pressure in the pulmonary vascular. So that means if your RV is going to fail, if your RV is going to fail, your symptoms are going to be what? What are your symptoms going to be? Congestion. Pulmonary congestion. Organ congestion, uh, con not pulmonary edema. Back pressure. Hepatomegaly. So you must understand this, it's very important for you to understand this, that when you have RV dysfunction or RV failure, you're going to have organ congestion, means the organs that are down, which includes liver, which includes kidney, which includes legs, even ascites. These are the things you want to look at. Are you understanding? So that is why yesterday I looked at the leg and I told there is any money in the leg. Uh, I looked at the liver and I said it looks slightly congested. Why was I doing that? Because I was trying to diagnose RV dysfunction as a cause of its weaning failure. You understanding? So, what about this? Adequate pulmonary pressure. So, what will happen? What will this patient have? Pressure over the total pain. What will happen? Now, we, we said one of the things RV failure is congestion. The other, what is going to happen here? Adequate pulmonary pressure will not go. Delivery of desaturated mixed fluid will not go. What is the after effect of that? Hypoxia. 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 Are you understanding? The problem is hypoxia there. It is not. It is not uh, what you see in cardiac failure, pulmonary edema is coming in. There is hypoxia. This patient will be, uh, pulmonary edema patient, how much more full he is, he will be fully conscious. But an uh, RV failure patient is there, he will, uh, if, he, if he goes into RV failure, he will actually become disoriented and he will probably go down. He will have central manifestations because he is hypoxic. Yesterday's patient, yesterday's patient, what was yesterday's patient? He was not in the senses though, when he came in. He was down, he was drowsy, why was that there? His blood pressure was normal. Why was he not? Hypoxia. It goes in favor of RV dysfunction. Generalized hypokinesia he was having of his leg. It's RV dysfunction. Are you understanding? Huh? So they will have symptoms that comes from hypoxia. Tissue hypoxia. Signified by actually very, very severity, and that's why the lactates actually go half. What are the lactate of that patient? 109. Are you understanding? So you must understand this clinical. You must understand this clinically how this works. Okay. So the, this shows that the right ventricle wall is thin now, and the LV develops around four to six times more pressure than the left uh, than the right ventricle. The right ventricle is pouch shaped, and the left ventricle is round. Similarly, internal there is a moderator band in the right ventricle, which you can see in the uh, on the echo. Then what are the differences between the right ventricle and the left ventricle? The shape is of the right ventricle is crescentic shape and uh, the left ventricle has a bullet shape on the ellipsoid on the oval shape. Then on the cross section it looks as a semi lunar and this looks as a circular. Then uh, there is the mus musculature is like thin heavily dilated wall and the musculature of the left ventricle is thick, thin uh, smooth wall and fine ramifications. So the pump of the right ventricle it pumps against the low resistance and low capacitance pump. And uh, peristaltic like motion from the uh, from the inflow to outflow and bellows like motion of the free wall towards the septum. 
whereas the left ventricle has a high resistance and high pressure pump. Uh, there is a dominant, dominant radial thickening and contraction during the ejection. Uh, right ventricle has no or minimal isovolumic period, so there are more of the hangout periods in that. And left ventricle has very defined isovolumic contraction and relaxations uh, with no hangout periods. The end diastolic wall thickness of the right ventricle is less than 3 mm and of the left ventricle is 11 mm. And the volume is almost uh, of the right ventricle is 49 to 101 ml per meter square. And of the left ventricle is 44 to 90 ml per meter square. The systolic pressure of the right ventricle is 25 mm and of that of the left ventricle is 120 mm. The coronary perfusion happens in uh, so both systole and diastole and the uh, left ventricle has almost exclusively in the diastole. Uh, right ventricle has a better adaptation to the volume overload states and uh, it has a higher compliance than the LV whereas left ventricle has better adaptation to the pressure overload states. Uh, right ventricle pumps blood into the low resistance pulmonary circuit, hence the RV is thin wall and cannot tolerate any increase in the afterload. Uh, right, right heart receives the systemic blood can tolerate changes in the volume that is free load but cannot tolerate changes in the pressure that is afterload. So high volume low pressure system of the lungs. <coughs> so definition of the RV failure, when the right heart cannot pump its venous trigger effectively into the lungs pulmonary circulation, it is called as a right-sided heart failure. There is also interventricular interdependence. The LV and RV are both enclosed in the stiff envelope of a pericardium. So they have a similar anti-aesthetic volume and there is no free, no free space for the acute increase in the volume of uh, ventricular dilatation. So that's when the RV anti volume increases owing to the increase in RV loading, increase in volume or pressure, it can only occur at the expense of the space devoted to the left ventricle. So it can cause a reduced left ventricle anti volume, decrease in LV anti compliance and reduced LV output. So there is a volume overload in the RV, it pushes the left ventricle. Uh, because of that, there is a reduced compliance of the left ventricle, reduced uh, LV and diastolic volume, and then uh, consequently a reduced LV output. So there will be a. So this is one of the ways that you get pulse pressure variation. You know, we talk about pulse pressure variation, this is one of the ways. So uh, this particular phenomenon, you understood this phenomenon? Understood what is the phenomenon, Pujika? What is happening? So this is your ventricle. You know, this is how it looks, right? This is how it looks. You have a D, uh, you have a ventricle that is crescentic, uh, and you have another one that's circular. Hmm? Now, in the event that there is a volume overload or a pressure overload, okay, volume overload or pressure overload, hmm? this will go out inside here. This septum will go out inside here. So in short, this volume will now reduce. Because it is bored out, this volume will now reduce. If this volume reduces here, then the output will reduce. Left ventricle and diastolic volume in diastole if it reduces. So what happens when you have and this this thing this thing, this more more and more amplified when the patient is hypovolemic. This is very much amplified when the patient is hypovolemic. Here, when the patient is hypovolemic. And now how, now I just found all there is more volume here and if it is hypovolemic why this is getting amplified. Okay, is the fact that when you are actually squeezing out, where, uh, you know, the, uh, the, on the ventilation, on the ventilation when the ventilator is squeezing that blood out from the pulmonary capillaries, it is also causing increase in pressure on the back side. So since it is increasing the pressure on the right ventricle because alveolus is distending and there is pulmonary capillaries here, it is distending. Okay, uh, there is going to be there is going to be uh, a pressure overload. This pressure overload will cause this to dilate, uh, and the next left ventricle will get lesser output, uh, lesser uh, intake, and then the blood pressure will fall. The stroke volume is going to come down, right? Uh, so the stroke volume is this. When the heart is actually this is what the lung uh, heart contractions during mechanical ventilation occurs. The moment the and this entire thing gets exacerbated when there is hypovolemia. So through our fluid responsiveness, we do something called tidal volume challenge. What are we doing? We are actually causing an increased pressure inside this part by increasing the tidal volume. When you are increasing the tidal volume, these pulmonary capillaries are getting squeezed. They are getting squeezed. So in the first cycle, what is happening? 
uh, in, in the first cycle, the amount of capillaries that are going into the left ventricle, the number of hemo amount of blood is increasing. So you will have big stroke volume in the first cycle because the moment you are given a big tidal volume uh, challenge, all this is how it is. No, this is you have an alveoli. This is what is going into the heart, and this is what is coming from the lungs. This is the capillary, right? So in the first stage, when you are actually giving very large tidal volumes, this blood is going to rush into the left ventricle. So the first beat will be a big beat, the first, okay. Then in a couple of cycles, what is going to happen? At the same time, when the ventricle is squeezed out, this is getting pressed. When this is getting pressed, what is happening? This ventricle is poorly compliant, okay. It is not able, able to pump in over here, okay. Since it's not able to pump in over here, the next couple of beats, the amount of blood that's supposed to come here is much lower. Understanding? Huh? Are you clear on this? Huh? So in the next couple of beats, it is coming much lower. And as it's coming lower, the lower blood is coming along here, the stroke volume will come down. <coughs> this stroke volume variation is what you are looking at when you are actually looking for fluid responsiveness. And the right ventricle plays a very important part to explain this to you. You understand? You understood or no? Yes. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Bones, that's what we found, that's what is found now, that when there is hypovolemia, these changes, atrial interactions are amplified, are massively amplified. And that is the reason that to diagnose a hypovolemic condition, we can, hypovolemic or a fluid responsive condition, we may want to uh, actually do a tidal volume challenge or look at pulse pressure variation. Are you understanding? You understood the ba background because pulse pressure variation, simple. Eh? Hmm? And important for you to understand is the RV. Is responsible for that. <coughs> Clear? Huh? So what are the what is the pathogenesis? So it will be either increase in the uh, right ventricular afterload or increase in the preload or there is a RV dysfunction, uh, there is a dysfunction of the con uh, RV contactility is reduced. So first it increases the right ventricular afterload. So it increases if there is an increased resistance to the blood flow out of the right ventricle into the lungs, the right ventricle volume increases and the pressure also increases. And there is a failure. So what are the causes? It's pulmonary artery hypertension, increased pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, pulmonary artery stenosis, left sided failure is the most common cause of the right sided failure. Pulmonary artery embolism. So now now let me let me just explain to you each of those now. Okay? Because uh, it's very important to understand what happens in what. Now, when you have pulmonary embolism, what is what are you known? What what is happening to the right ventricle? When you dilated. Pulmonary hypertension is it get dilated? It's the same pathogenesis, but why is it not happening? It's the same pathogenesis, right? It should dilate there also, but it is not dilating now. So, what do you think is happening? Why is it happening like that? Are you understanding the question? You have the same pathogenesis, but you have two different manifestations. One where the pulmonary ventricle, uh, the left, right ventricle dilated, and in one way it is not dilated, it is just getting hypertrophic. Right? Huh? Why is that occurring? Why is that occurring? Is because your earlier slide did that answer. This one. So here, if you look at it, huh? if you look at it, there are a few things that she's mentioned very important. This and you must understand this. It's a low capacitance pump. That means the capacity in which it is pumping is very important, right? So if your pulmonary embolism occurs, the pulmonary embolism occurs, it is now pumping into a smaller circulation bed because a huge amount pulmonary artery embolism, मतलब छोटा embolism भी होता है. It is somewhere in the second generation, so a huge population of the arteries or the bed is getting lost because there is a clot there. It is not allowing it. Now what is happening to this poor RV? It's a poor capacity pump. Okay, so the where it has to pump is actually reduced. The amount of place where the blood should go is actually reduced, and this is this is what the problem is with the right ventricle that it is a low capacity pump. So the moment that occurs, it now has to pump against a huge amount of space. You are, uh, I mean, much lesser amount of space compared to what it was. So what happens? It dilates. It's just not able to do it. You understand? Contrast from what happens when it when there is ARDS. When there is ARDS, what is happening? There is pulmonary vascular resistance increasing. Pulmonary vascular resistance increasing, which is different from capacity. So, when you have pulmonary vascular resistance coming down, uh, when resistance is coming down, it is slowly, slowly being able to pump that. It is not that the entire bed is gone, capacity is not gone. 
It is just a resistance that is slightly increasing. So slightly, slightly, slightly it will dilate or slightly get hypertrophy. Right? Clear? And that is why this is very poor. It is very short. And that the next statement here that she mentioned about also makes that important that it has got better direction of volume over load states. You understand? So you give volume, this will not occur. Chances of occurring are lesser as compared to if there is a pressure over load. You understand? Clear? I didn't understand this. So there are two ways where you can probably cause the RV to dilate. Uh, one of the ways is, so you might think that uh, the way you have understood how many embolism why it dilates the uh, right ventricle. You have understood that. Yes. How many embolism dilates the right ventricle. But other than that, you might think that, are, anyways, it's not a good pressure. So if I give more volume, it should dilate. You might think like this, no? That if I give more volume, it is not worth the pressure to push it. So it will dilate. But what happens is, it is more adapted to volume over load states. So if you give volume, it's not this way that the RV will get dilated. Are you understanding? Uh, the RV will still pass the blood into the pulmonary, right? the pulmonaries are okay. Clear? Uh, but when you have the pulmonary is not okay, the RV will dilate. You understand? So, preload dependent. It is basically preload dependent. So, tomorrow if you have RV failure and you say, Are you RV failure is fluid, it is wrong. Are you understanding what I am saying? So, this, this is important when you think of inferior myocardial functions. When you have inferior one myocardial infarctions, what we know is the fact that the RV is not probably okay. Posterior V4R is elevated. Okay, V4R is elevated, the right sided lead is elevated. What you should be thinking? Well, to optimize this cardiac system, I may need some water, I may need some volume. I will not say he's got every failure, he's got pulmonary muscle electronic volume. No, you will give volume. Because you require that volume there. Huh? Because it is more adapted to volume. Volume more load states. Here? Huh? Exactly. Since not pulmonary acid resistance, capacity. See what is happening is you have the lung, okay, and you have the pulmonary artery that is supplying, right? Now it is not going to occlude somewhere here. It is probably going to occlude somewhere here. So there is a huge proportion that probably will not get blood. Not only that, the issue is what initially the this same blood, say 30 ml or whatever, was going to all of the circulation. Now, suddenly this 30 ml is going to do this and this. So, what is going to happen in the capacity? Pulmonary capacity has come down. So, this is not able to tolerate, not able to generate that pressure. That is why it dilates. You are understanding? Huh? So, so, what if we give fluids in this case, sir? The issue is that only. You may want to give fluids, but at the end of the day, it is not going to, it's not going to make a difference. That's why thrombolysis. You are understanding? Huh? And this year, there is no capacity only. So you may want to give some fluid, but it is not going to work in the back of your mind. You know, because it is going to get dilated and dilated and more dilated. Are, are you understanding? It may not work. So that's why pulmonary embolism, you either thrombolyze it as quickly as possible to improve the capacity there. You, you understand? Now you don't try to give lobotomy and noradrenaline and all these things and wait, wait, wait. No, the TPA should go first. Urocanase should go first. Are you understanding? Because it is not going to improve. You do whatever you want, it is not going to improve. In fact, you may create problems by giving noradrenaline because at this stage, it will also noradrenaline not only work on alpha, it will also work on alpha one and alpha two. It may cause pulmonary vascular resistance to actually increase when it's not increased. You understand? Here the problem is not vascular resistance. Here the problem is capacitance. Okay. Huh? Yeah. So we will dilate to create the pressure to pump the blood against. Yes, the because and that's right. Yes, no against capacity. 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 Ah, but you must understand RV capacity. Capacity to it, it is not able to, you know, push that blood. That's why it gets dilated. Compared to vascular resistance. So, if you have a patient who is having or uh, who is ARDS, you are expecting what? Interstitial to be fibrous. You expect interstitial to be edematous. Interstitial to have more fluid. So, needless to say, the pulmonary vascular resistance will be going up. But that doesn't cause your RV to get dilated. It may cause it to get dysfunctional, but not dilated. You understand? It because it is dysfunctional but not dilated. That's why in a pulmonary embolism, if you see dilated ventricle, you must understand that there is a problem here. In the of fluid overload, you might think, are you dilated and let's not give fluid. It's not like that. You understand? Huh? So, you got the point, you understood what I'm saying, right? Yeah. So, if we give 
there is an increase in diaventricular free load, the volume increases and the pressure increases. There will be a back pressure on the RA, uh, the RA pressure also increases, there is an IVC congestion, then uh, there will be hepatic congestion uh, and uh, peripheral edema. So, if this is an increase uh, work in pumping the blood into the pulmonary artery, it causes an increase uh, work in pumping the blood into the pulmonary arteries. The causes could be valvular regurgitation, ASD, VSD, septal defects. If there is a decrease in right ventricular contraction, that can also cause a RV failure. So, if there is a RV infarct, decreases the ventricular contraction, myocarditis, and the non-compliance of the right ventricle. The right ventricle cannot feel properly and the expansion is restricted. So, it happens in restrictive cardiomyopathy, for example, amyloidosis, uh, concentric RVH, uh, decreases the compliance of the right ventricle. Clinical features, symptoms are uh, orthopnea, then the bilateral pedal edema, back pressure increases and there will be peripheral edema, epigastric discomfort, enlarged uh, congested or uh, tender liver, ascites, and the sign will be a distension of the IJV veins, AVP, hepatojugular reflex, uh, compression of the congested liver increases the neck vein distension, gallop rhythm uh, at the left sternal edge, and systolic murmur of uh, um, tricuspid regurgitation, organomegaly, ventricular arrhythmia will be there, there will be signs of DVT also, cyanosis of the mucous membrane. On mechanically ventilated patients, there will be increase in O2 requirement and sudden cardiovascular collapse. This is the RV section. So, these are probably the uh, mechanisms of RV dysfunction. If there is a hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction, it increases the uh, resistance and the uh, uh, after load, then mechanical ventilation, pulmonary thromboembolism, um, micro thrombine pulmonary and uh, or myocardial uh, areas, then the LV dysfunction, uh, then there, are, there is a cytokine release and that causes uh, release of endotoxins, uh, causes capillary leak, endothelial dysfunction, capillary leak and hypovolemia. Also, ischemia and arrhythmia can cause RV dysfunction. Causes of right heart failure, increase in pressure load, there will be endothelial dysfunction, vasoconstriction, mechanical obstruction, pulmonary embolism, IID, then uh, pulmonary diseases, destruction of the pulmonary vascular bed, uh, chronic air flow obstruction, emphysema, chronic bronchitis, there is a neuromuscular chest wall restriction, then primary pulmonary hypertension, ARDS, positive pressure ventilation, elevated pulmonary venous pressure in LVF, mitral stenosis and insufficiency, Hypoventilation states and uh, pulmonary wall stenosis. Then increase in volume load is uh, again ASD, VSD, pulmonary or tricuspid wall regurgitation, um, uh, hyperthyroidism, anomalous pulmonary venous return, decrease in contractility is RCA occlusion, RVMI, uh, relative RV ischemia secondary to the pressure or the volume overload. With the pressure and volume overload, the RV dilates and contract, tries to contract faster, leading to the RV, uh, RV myocardial ischemia. Systemic hypotension will cause poor coronary perfusion, and since the uh, perfusion of the right ventricle also occurs in the systole, there will be more of the hypo, uh, hypoperfusion of the uh, right ventricular muscles. Intrinsic myocardial disease, for example, RV cardiomyopathy, sepsis, uh, cytokine induced myocardial depression, that will cause uh, decrease in contractility. Inflammatory effects of the cardiopulmonary bypass and myocarditis. The pericardial diseases, constrictive pericarditis, tampon and causing impaired diastolic feeling, uh, right ventricular confusions in chest trauma, mediastinal radiation, and redevelopment. So, what we find in the ECG, uh, there will be right axis deviation, dominant R in B1 and dominant S in B5, there will be P permanent, RS ratio is, will be more than 1 in B1. Then uh, in right ventricular myocardial infarction and the reason by ST elevation in right side at V3, V4. Uh, and Q wave pattern in leads V1 to V3 as well as right side at Q pattern in leads V3 to V6. Also in the uh, V3 environment, if there is a ST elevation in lead 3, if it is more than in lead 2, that will also indicate that right uh, ventricular infarction. There will be right ventricular strain pattern on the ECG, T inversions from V1 to V4 and S1 to 3, V3 pattern. Chest X-ray and pulmonary embolism will show enlargement of the main pulmonary artery and regional oligemia are seen on in the massive PE. Echocardiography, uh, normal size of the RV should be less than two thirds the size of the LV. If it's larger than this, it's considered as RV dilated. 
RB cells can be measured by applying the four chamber view. Uh, right ventricular failure and dilatation leading to the encroachment of the interventricular septum of the left ventricle causes increase in the left ventricle, uh, it decreases in the left ventricular and diastolic uh, volume and pressure. And in echocardiography, uh, if uh, the normal TFC will be uh, 2 uh, centimeter, uh, 2.4 centimeter. So, what is TFC? Uh, uh, on the tricuspid valve, valve, on the lateral side of the tricuspid valve, just put the pulse wave Doppler and see what it goes up. Okay, it's a very important measure. With that, you will be able to understand whether there is RV dysfunction or not. This has to be done in which patients or those patients who are ERDS on the ventilator. You know, you can do it either by strain, pattern by speckle, uh, you know, spe speckling, or you can do it by TAPSI. TAPSI is a simple, it is of course simple to do, uh, but you must learn to do it. If you can do it, very well and fine. It's simple. Find a tricuspid valve. On the lateral side, put a pulse wave Doppler and just measure the pulse. Simple. Huh? So, is this uh, a distance? M mode and M mode. Yeah, M mode also. You can do M mode. Put it in M mode, put it over there and get it. Same. Huh? So, the normal taxi will be uh, 2.4 centimeter. Yeah. Uh, normal taxi is 2.4 centimeter. Yeah. Uh, and uh, normal taxi is 2.4 centimeter. Yeah. Uh, so, what is but here, here if it is decreased than 17 millimeter, that is 1.7 centimeter, then it will show as the RV systolic dysfunction. Mm -hmm. Then uh, RV fractional area changes to less than 35 percent. So at this side, strain. Fraction. Fractional area shortening, that is strain. This is something called strain. RV strain that is called. So RV strain can be done with the tissue doppler imaging as well as repair tissue doppler imaging basically. Then uh, RV diastolic dysfunction, if E by A is less than 0 0.8 by tissue doppler, uh, the dilated RV chambers, uh, di diameter 41 mm at the base, 35 mm at the middle level and longitudinal dimension to more than 86 mm. RV endiastolic uh, volume uh, upon LV endiastolic uh, more than 1. Then RV OT dilatation, if the diameter is more than 27 mm at the end of the diastole at the level of the pulmonary wall, that will indicate the RV OT dilatation. Uh, also, there are some signs uh, that, that will show as a flattening or a displacement of the interventricular septum towards the left ventricle, which cause the left ventricle to be D shaped and uh, D shaped ventricle. A uh, macronal sign uh, and uh, high PA systolic pressure will be fine. So, I mean, when we look at intensive care, TAPC is one thing you can look at. Then the important thing that you can look at is the dilatation. In pulmonary embolism, when you look at, you have equalization of the ventricles or larger ventricles or macronal sign, which basically means the apex. Okay. So this is the RV free wall which is hypopilotic uh, and this is the apical sparing and it is continuous with the left ventricle. There will be a left ventricle apex hyperkinetic which is called as the macronal sign. So it will be uh, opposed, the contraction will be the opposite. opposite. Uh, then this is a D shaped ventricle that the ileus is uh, pushed to the left ventricle. So normally when you see macronal sign and RV and all, what will it be? Pulmonary embolism or it could be right coronary infarcts. Mm -hmm. so these are two places where you can see McConnell's sign, where you can see uh, uh, the RV and RV, the pulmonary embolism. But you will not see it, uh, you can see massive pulmonary artery Massive pH. That can happen. Okay? Right. So, but you don't be accurate. Your pH won't be accurate. It won't be very accurate. No, it won't be very accurate. No, optimal treatment. But sometimes that may occur, you know, for example, you have a patient who's come with systolic failure. And now what you do is, you decide to give an oral plan. And you give very high doses of noradrenaline and adrenaline. You know, when that occurs, the next thing that is going to happen is the pH going very, very high. And that will cause your RV to get dilated. Then you think, you know, everything is, that is why echo should be your first focus. And then you see, because you, whatever you are doing will probably change the echo. Even if you are looking at pulmonary valves. So if you start doing it on a regular basis, you will understand what I am doing. So understand to think what I am thinking of, you will have to do the same things again and again, which is probably evidence based. So if you have patients of, on the ventilator, look at it. You will learn what is happening. So treatment part will be optimization of the preload, optimization of the afterload, and uh, uh, improve the contact feeding. So in critically ill patients, are mostly flu mostly fluid uh, depleted. The intravascular status uh, is depleted due to the increased permeability, the insensible losses. Most of the patients are on sedatives, which decrease the venous tone and the reduced venous return. Patients on mechanical ventilation increase. Uh, there is an increase in intrathoracic pressure, which causes reduced RV preload. So, uh, fluid resuscitation uh, in RV failure patients depend on the RV afterload. 
So in uh, right ventricular MI, there is the uh, the afterload is normal. So fluid resuscitation improves the cardiac output. Understood, this da. Now you understood. See here, the right side, the lungs are okay. There is no pulmonary vascular resistance. There is no pulmonary hypertension. This is giving like a conduit. So in RV myocardial infarction, that V4R or V3R getting ST yes, elevated, yes. elevated, or RV showing signs of myocardial sinus or something like that, they will give the fluids because it is going to move from here to there. Though there is RV infarct. Are you understanding? Huh? Are you understanding this? Huh? Very important to understand this because it has normal afterload. Okay. Huh? Our our uh, right side of the heart has a problem with afterload. Not with preload, okay. That's why you don't reduce the preload. Understand? Mm -hmm. Huh? You don't reduce the preload. Clear? Yeah? So in RVMI, the fluid resuscitation will improve. <coughs> yeah. There is an acute fee. There is increase in RV afterload. So fluid resuscitation causes more of a distension of the right ventricle, shifting of the IVS to LV, decrease of the. Understood just now. When you are asking this question, I don't. We we'll have to, you know, we we'll have to see at that moment what is happening, what is the after, what is happening over there. So if you give some fluid, there's a high possibility the RV can distend it here. Mm -hmm. You understand? So more RV distension will again cause the poor perfusion of the ventricular muscles and RV is skinny also. Mm -hmm. Optimization of the RV after load. So common and critical ill patients, the factors that cause a peripheral vascular resistance increase their hypoxia, hypercapnia, acidosis. To try to uh, solve all these three problems. Pulmonary vasodilators they act by decreasing the pulmonary vessel resistance and impedance and increasing RV stroke volume and output, avoiding, avoiding systemic hypotension and maintaining the coronary perfusion. So inhaled nitric oxide has a rapid onset and short half life, so rapidly reduces the RV afterload and, and short term therapy. Prostacyclin derivatives uh, used in severe PAH and RV failure, ipoprotein, prostinol, then uh, tree prostinil and iloprost. Uh, phosphodiesterase inhibitor 5, uh, five phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitor, oral sildenafil and tadalafil reduce the pulmonary vascular resistance and improve the myocardial perfusion and may improve the RV contract rate. So are they being used as of now? So you know this this requires a tertiary set of care where you are monitoring pulmonary RT hypertension, you know where because our usual volume we use will not give you this answer. Are you understanding? This is not what you need. It needs a higher set of echocardiography. It needs a little bit of more understanding of what is happening over there. So at that time you may want to use. So I've used nitric oxide, seen the improvement. So that is my ARDS. ARDS, one of the big problems is the fact that you have hypoxia. You have hypoxia because why do you have hypoxia? Apart from the problem of movement of oxygen from the alveolus into the circulation, there is also an increase in pulmonary vascular resistance, which is basically causing this issue. So if you want to actually dilate the pulmonary vasculature, you may probably reduce RV strain. You understand? We reduce RV strain. So that's why nitric oxide has been tried again and again in the, in the realm of ARDS. Because it improves hypoxia. After all, if RV contracts less, hypoxia is going to occur. <coughs> Are you understanding? Similarly, the same situation with phosphodiesterase inhibitors and process cyclins. Okay? Optimization of the RV contract So where is this used? This is usually used if you see in pediatrics. So highly complete disease. In all these places where there is ARDS developing, they will actually give real uh, process cyclins. Process Okay? Uh -huh. So role of vasopressors, one should increase the systemic vascular resistance and systemic BP without rising the peri uh, pulmonary vascular resistance and improve contract rate. So it, should, uh, it shouldn't have any effect on the pulmonary vascular resistance. Norepinephrine is the initial agent in RV failure with hypotension. This is because of the fact that norepinephrine apart from the alpha action also has a beta 1 action. Huh? Norepinephrine has got an alpha 1 as well as a beta 1 action. So it will probably improve the cardiac output along with the increasing the systemic vascular resistance. It is known to drop pulmonary vascular resistance. Uh, it is known to drop PVR. That's when RR becomes a very important choice. Yeah. And the vitamin and lower doses will improve the cardiac output. So you understood why yesterday I was asking for dobutamine. I called up in the night and said dobutamine chalo koro, dobutamine chalo koro. You, you understand for that particular patient. Huh? So, vitamin and lower doses will improve the cardiac output, then higher doses will be called tachycardia and uh, more RV ischemia. In uh, the mechanical ventilation strategy will be lung protective ventilation, low tidal volume, low blood pressure and uh, keep, keep uh, avoid high peak. Yeah, I think you have done it very well, RV failure. So, there is a difference between RV dysfunction and RV failure, okay? RV dysfunction is, uh, can be found only by the echo, whereas RV failure is very obvious. 
Okay, army is very obvious. You have pulmonary embolism was in army failure. Right? Because army dysfunction is only found out by echo and your clinical examination as to what you're looking at, GBP going up, CBP going up, things like that are correct. You know, army dysfunction, you see the RA equal, almost equal, or you know, what is larger than what it was yesterday. You know, larger than what it was yesterday. Just see that you know this is probably going to be army dysfunction. Okay? Clear on this? Because army dysfunction to pick up, you learn how to do TAPC, it's important. Okay? It's important so that you'll be able to pick up those small, small things. Okay? Um, 